Joshua Walker here at Japan Society. Okay, I'm still not at Japan Society, but I'm really excited to be talking to my friend Jeremy Hunter, who's the founding director of the Executive Mind Leadership Institute at Drucker School of Management. He's actually been called the Zen of Drucker. Uh, Jeremy, I, I want you to kind of just start uh, by telling us, as someone who actually practices mindfulness and really is all about the human mind, what has it been like going through these last two months of COVID-19? Um, what has it revealed about yourself, but more broadly about your work? Yeah, uh, you know, the Peter Drucker said that you can't manage other, others unless you manage yourself first. And in my mind, that begins with your own mind. And so as this is, as this is happening, you know, how do you help people recognize that they may be stuck in a fear state or a survival state and how to help them unstuck themselves and move into a direction that's positive and helpful and contributing to, to the people around them. The, the image that I have is like, how do you be an island of coherence in a sea of chaos? You know, and from a, a leader's point of view, from my point of view, that's what a leader needs to do, right? Like, how do you be the island of calm and the island of clarity, the island of coherence in a space where, you know, there's, there's a lot of chaos around you. And then how do you help grow that island? How do you help the people around you grow their own island? So, and then eventually, how do you connect all those islands? So that's, uh, it's been a real call to action uh, in, in my, uh, in my world. And so, uh, uh, and I've been doing this now for 20 years, and you know, now you have this global crisis where humanity is simultaneously, you know, all around the world going through this almost the exact same experience. And uh, to me, these kinds of crises are, I, I, you know, to be frank, there, there are the moments we find our greatness, you know, and, you know, that's the role crisis play can play if you know how to how to step into it you know you you find the strength that you didn't know you had you find the capacity to to love and care that you didn't know you had um, and you know if we do this well if we handle this kind of intense challenge well at the other end of it ideally we come out better stronger uh, more connected uh, than we were before that and uh, that's how I've been approaching this. I mean, I love that approach because so much of what we see uh, out there, not just in social media, but the news is the negative. It's so easy to focus yeah. on the negativity and that image of being an island, uh, an island of coherence in a world of chaos uh, has never been more relevant. Um, some islands that you and I care a lot about, the islands of Japan, uh, have some lessons here. And even watching the way they've reacted to COVID-19, um, Tell us about your own personal connection to Japan and kind of how you think about that island in the midst of this broader uh, kind of world of chaos that we're dealing with. Yeah, well, my great grandfather was a sumo wrestler and uh, <laughs> my, my mother's Japanese. Uh, my wife is Japanese. I think our cats are Japanese. So uh, uh, we talk to them in Japanese and they, and they answer. But um, so I've been going to Japan my whole life and it's, uh, it's a big part of my life. Uh, I, Two former students and I founded a consulting business there as well uh, called Transform. And uh, so, you know, to me, Japan is a second home or, uh, you know, the other first home in, in an, another way of thinking about it. Um, you know, I think that Japan has a lot to offer. Right? And one is, I, I think, a greater awareness that you're internal state matters and and that Japan has all of this this cultural legacy for creating a kind of internal discipline or an internal coherence and that I think is unappreciated in some way uh, at least oftentimes in Japan <laughs> but uh, you know one of the things that I've been thinking about lately before the whole covid stuff happened is that why why suddenly are so many people going to Japan now? I mean, uh, you know, in, in record numbers uh, to, to the point where it's becoming kind of a social problem. You know, Japan has one foot firmly in the analog. And whereas in, in a way that other cultures don't, you know, through craft, through art, through food, 
and material reality and the refinement of Japanese material reality is something that's completely unique in the world, right? Which is, I think, why so many of us who love Japan love Japan, right? And that there's this orientation towards beauty and the, and the, and the creation of beauty in, in anything, you know? I mean, I was watching a show the other day about, about this, about a mom who, you know, and her bento making skills. I mean, so like beauty and the expression of beauty suffuses this entire culture in a way that is totally unique in, in the world. And at the same time, if we look at what else is happening in the world, again, pre, pre-pandemic, is the increasing dematerialization of life through digital technology. It's that, that as things become more dematerialized, it's a lot easier to feel kind of unanchored in all of that. And, you know, that we're, we have our heads stuck in a screen a lot of the time and that, and that we come, become increasingly disconnected to our material reality. And that, you know, and research has shown this, right? It increases anxiety, um, you know, people, people feel disconnected from their own body, uh, that there's a, there is a negative aspect to this. And what I realize is that people are attracted to Japan because they offer, because it offers some kind of alternative to that, right? That there's, there's a way that you can engage in the world in this kind of refined material world that reminds you and reinforces the fact that you live in a body and that, and that you can, uh, uh, how do I express this? You know, how, that, that it's, it returns you to yourself in some way. And no other culture has that. And I, I think that at this moment, Japan has this really great opportunity to help the world define or, or redefine a kind of hybrid analog digital culture. Like how do we live in a, in an, in an increasingly digitized world, but still have groundedness in our own being. Like I, I keep telling my Japanese friends, I like, look, you can't digitize an ofuro, right? You can't digitize the bathtub. And uh, to me, the, the ofuro is one of the great cultural legacies of, of Japan. In fact, we, I put one in our house because it, it's this daily ritual that you can go into the bathtub in this quiet place and and recollect yourself um, and you know Japan has so much of that tea ceremony and flower arrangement and and all the culinary arts you know those those can't be dematerialized so easily and and I, I think you know Japan has so much to offer the world right now in, in that Obviously, I agree uh, very much with that, and it's why we're, we're, we're friends and also fellow travelers. One of the, the, the things that you're describing to me is almost what the post-COVID world is going to look like, right? Mm -hmm. Because we are living our lives through screens. Like, how many of us are sitting here uh, with Zoom calls back to back to back, feeling more tired than we ever have, and are just yearning for the day to go back to that human interaction? There's something magical about that. So I guess the question is, you seem supremely uh, well set up professionally. To be to rise to this challenge, you talked about crisis bringing out uh, kind of great leaders and exposing it. How did you get to where you are? Like, how, how does one become the founding director of the Executive Mind Leadership Institute? How does one become kind of a professor of uh, the practice on these areas? Like, it just seems like a job that you kind of were uniquely made for. How did you get to where you are? What's the creation of Jeremy Hunter? <laughs> uh, that's easy. One word: suffering. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, um, I, I was, uh, I will soon be 50 and, uh, I, uh, when I was 20, so almost 30 years ago, right. I was diagnosed with a, a terminal illness and, uh, there was no cure. There still is no cure, uh, but an autoimmune disease that was attacking my kidneys. And so I, I, uh, the, the prognosis was 90% chance of mortality within five years. And 
uh, my father and I were leaving the hospital that day and, and I, I looked at my dad and I said, you know, there's like a 10% survival rate, right? And so I said, you know, that's good news, dad. Uh, and he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? I said, well, somebody's gotta be in the 10% and, and, and I decided it was gonna be me. And I, and I really took that not as a medical challenge, but really as a spiritual one. And like, what was it, you know, what could I grapple with inside that I could learn from, basically? And I, I was an East Asian studies major at Wittenberg University, which, as you know, has a, a, a renowned East Asian studies program. And I went back to school and talked to my professor, Eugene Swanger, and uh, he, was my, he was my religions professor. We're still friends to this day, 30 years later. And he, he says, don't worry. He was, he, and he has this very kind of uh, authoritative confidence. And he says, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. And he gives me this book, The Three Pillars of Zen by Philip Kaplow. He said, here, read this. Which, as you know, is the first book in English to teach Westerners how to do Zen. And I thought, okay, maybe I can like meditate my way out of this situation. It was this totally naive thought, right? Like maybe if I meditated, something like a miracle would happen and I would keep on living. And, uh, 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 you know, I was 20 years old and very optimistic. And so I read this book, right? And it gave you very clear instructions, like what to do with your mind. And, and if you're 20 years old and you're staring down your mortality, you know, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety. And that book helped me, you know, in part really helped me manage that internal experience. And, you know, I, I, I lived another year and then in the year after that and another year, and then eventually 17 years went by. And so in a way a miracle did happen and I kept on living. Uh, but it made me realize, you know, the interesting thing about kidney disease is that it's painless and that it can mysteriously stabilize. And just as mysteriously, it can destabilize. And so you don't know if today's going to be the day. Right? Is today going to be the day? You know, to, to be frank, but this is the reality of it, you know, is today going to be the day where I find blood in my urine? And so... You know, I don't know how many times you go to the bathroom a day, but you know, every time I go to the bathroom, it's going to be, okay, is this, is this going to be it? And so I had to learn how to train my mind not to be overwhelmed by that reality. And, and so, and it wasn't easy. I mean, I, I won't sit here and say that there weren't times I was totally frozen from anxiety or completely bowed by, by really powerful depression. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it gave me something to do where I could keep moving forward. Um, and as a culture, you know, if we step back as a culture, modern cultures, you know, modern cultures are all about the outside. And I, I have a, they're all about m managing and manipulating the outer world. And you very rarely get any kind of systematic training on how to manage the inner world, right? Case in point, I have a student who, who worked for Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which you know is the part of NASA that makes the space probes. And his part of that organization was the part that calculated the navigational pathway of space probes through the solar system. And so, so it was him and his team that put the, that put the the, the uh, rover on Mars and put the probe on Pluto, right? It's like me standing in my living room and taking a quarter and throwing it and, it, and that, that quarter you know, lands in your window at the Japan Society, right? That's basically what he does. So a brilliant human being and a really good guy. But he could not have a difficult conversation with a person in the, in the office next to him, right? That was an impossibility. And, and when I, we were role playing a scenario and he took his chair and pulled it across the room so that we were, I, I was gonna be the person he had to have the difficult conversation with. And, 
And I sat down in my chair and he took his chair and pulled it about 20 feet away from me and then sat down and said, I'm ready to have the conversation. And I thought, I just said, did you notice what you just did? And, um, and he didn't notice, right? He didn't notice. And, and I said, so like, what's happening inside you right now? And he's quiet for a minute and he says, I wanna run out of this room. And, it, and then it struck me like, wow, like he is the representation of this culture. He can do amazing things with technology, but he can't, and he can stick, you know, he can stick a quarter on a planet tens and millions of miles away from here. But to be able to deal with the thing that's closest to him, right, the thing inside him was completely a mystery. And so I realized, wow, that's what this society is about, you know? And then, you know, and as you're going back and forth between these two cultures, Japan and the United States, you realize that there's, there's a difference there in some way. And, uh, and, I, and I realized, at least for us here, and, and maybe for all, all modern cultures in some way, you know, we don't get this kind of training of how to deal with what's going on inside so that you can be effective, you know, as a leader outside. And so, so that's really what my whole career is about. And, and you know, Drucker, Peter Drucker, who, uh, you know, we know also is a great friend of Japan, uh, had this insight that you can't manage other people unless you manage yourself first. And so, but where do you learn how to do that, right? You know, and uh, so that's really been what my work has been about. And, and at some level, at some very fundamental level, which I think is what's germane to this particular moment, is really about your relationship to fear. As leaders, right, if you want to be that island of coherence for people and the people and the communities you serve, right, you have to be able to understand and manage your own fear. Um, or else, you know, that fear response is going to negate all the creativity you have, all your capacity to connect with other people, your capacity to innovate, your capacity to look at a situation that seems impossible and, and learn how to create choices that, that at the beginning of that you didn't see. And so, you know, when I work with, when I work with my students or work with my clients, you know, the, the, the aim of the work is to help people create choices. How do you help people create choices? It's not about let's get zen out on the mountaintop. It's about how in the midst of all this stuff, can I manage what's going on inside myself and help people around me manage what's going on inside themselves so that we can come up with answers that we couldn't have seen before. Right? I think the big opportunity is how do you use this crisis as a moment for transformation? As I was saying earlier, you know, it's like, how do you use this as a way to become better, to be stronger, right? To be able to create something that, in, that wasn't there before. And so, you know, as much pain as there is in the world and, and so many people suffering, so many uh, you know, people losing their jobs and, and businesses and small businesses going under, you know, um, the significant percentage of both Japan and the United States are made up of small businesses and uh and they're going through a tough time you know as as much as much pain as there is in that uh, positive aspect is that we have the opportunity to create and and that we can we can really find our greatness you know find the greatness that is inherent in all of us that in calmer smoother waters we never get the opportunity to find and and in that right the we have the opportunity to serve and be useful to the people around us who need it. A colleague of mine said to me the other day, he said, you know, crisis is kind of like a referendum on your life. Like, because, you know, when things get tough, A, you'll see who your friends are. B, you get to see like, have you managed your life in, in a way uh, to this point, to up to this point that uh, has served you or not, right? And so, for those people, they can be in a really tough spot, right? When, when things get tough and suddenly they look around and there's no one there because they didn't invest in the relationships, 
then you know I really feel for those people. So I, I learned that you know so you know to tie back to my health story in in 2008 uh, a physician friend of mine read off all the symptoms of read through a list of the symptoms of uremic poisoning which are the signs that your kidneys are failing and, and as he's reading off i'm like checking off every one of these things and i realize oh you know like time is up uh i i, I kind of i took five years and turned it into 17 and that that was pretty good and, and maybe that's it and so um so my doctor says, okay, you got basically you got three choices, right? You can go on dialysis. The American dialysis mortality rate is 20% a year. Uh, you could go on a list and and wait for a, a donation, you know, um, some you know, some horrible thing to happen to somebody, and hopefully they check the organ donor box and hopefully you're a match. In Los Angeles at that time, uh, 60 million people needed, or in the United States, 60 million people needed a kidney and about 16 million got them. Now, now it's far worse than that. And that you could be on that list for seven to eight years. And, and so if the mortality rate on dialysis is 20% a year and you're, you have to wait eight years, you know, the curves don't intersect at the right moment. And, and then he said, and then there's the third option, which is living donation. You could ask somebody. And so, you know, I, I don't know about you, but most men I know won't even ask for directions, right? Let alone, uh, let alone an, an organ. And so, but I, I realized that was really kind of my only choice. And, um, and so I penned a letter and sent it out to everybody, basically everybody I knew. And, and then you waited. And it was a tremendously humbling experience because it was like, it was like putting a referendum on your life to say, okay, do you think my life, hey, everybody that I know, do you think my life is worth saving? And, uh, um, and it's like, you know, throwing a birthday party, wondering if anybody's gonna show up for it. And so, um, you know, so you waited and anybody who's gone through organ, the organ donation process knows that it is, it is nothing but uncertainty, right? Because you're waiting and then what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? And, uh, and so I, I learned how to be, how do you deal with uncertainty? And what could I control? I could control nothing in that. And, and at times it was terrifying. But, but in the end, uh, I sent that letter out in February of 2008. And in, in May of 2008, the coordinator at the hospital, Cedar sinai Hospital in Beverly Hills, which, you know, is one of the world's great hospitals. And I'm so privileged to be able to go there. I, I uh, thank my lucky stars, actually. Uh, calls me and says, you know, we're, hi, hi, Jeremy, we're calling to let you know that we're going to turn your donors away. And I'm, I, I remember I was sitting in the parking lot and I thought, what, what are you saying? And, and she goes, well, you know, there, there's so many now that we can't, you know, we can't process the, the volunteers for, for the other patients. And so that, that's why I'm calling. And I thought, well, what, what is, what are you talking about? And then, you know, the, and I said, well, how many of them are there? And, uh, and, and at that point, there were 24, I think. And then, then the competitive part of me got on the line and said, you know, well, you know, what's the record? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and she said, yeah, I think the old record was seven. And, uh, and it turned out 13 of, those, 13 of those 24 were my former students. And... And and then and then the group and then I had students who couldn't raise uh, you know who who weren't able to donate an organ so they raised money and and I uh, I they raised sixty thousand dollars for me and uh, so I could live off of that and and so and then I got checks from people I didn't even know the Claremont Police Association sent me a check for thirty five dollars for which I was am is still eternally grateful and and that's when I realized you know okay this this is I, I learned a lot through that experience about what it meant to be a human being. And, and that, you know, for me, that surgery was not just about receiving an organ. Uh, in the end, in the end I, I did receive an organ from one of my students who was a Amazon warrior of a, of a person. And she, uh, she rebuilds motorcycles and V8 engines and things like that. And uh, quite a remarkable person named Laura Newman. And, uh, 
but but what I learned through that was, you know, it wasn't just about receiving this physical Oregon, but it was a it was an amazing transformation of learning how to grapple with your own mortality and and then and then open yourself to be generous to the world's kindness and 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 so you know on the other side of that i'm i'm in my bonus round uh so in my, what am i going to do in my with my bonus time you know i i met a wonderful woman from yamanashi prefecture you know we have a little son he's 4 uh now and um and so so you know this part of my life is really about service how can i be useful and so and that's what i would encourage everybody to to think about in this time it's like it's like how do you use this to face something inside yourself uh and grow from it you know like one of the things i've been asking the people i work with like what is covid-19 trying to teach you about you what is it trying to teach you? What is it trying to ask you? you know, what is it asking you to let go of? What is it asking you to step into? You know, what, what greatness inside you is there just waiting to be expressed in some way? And then look around you and ask, you know, who, who needs your help? Who needs your help? And how can you help? Even if it's just cooking for somebody who's going on hard times or you know, making donation to, you know, in Los Angeles, we have the LA County Regional Food Bank. You know, how do you support them so they can support other people? You know, it doesn't have to be some grand gesture, but just to look around and how can you contribute and how can you be of service? And rather than being stuck in our own fear. Right? And, and I think that's, that's the opportunity we have. Wow. There's no way to put a, a bow on what you've just shared, but I don't wish any of our viewers uh, the heartbreaking experience of kidney failure. But on the other hand, I wish that everyone has the same level of optimism and can-do attitude. Uh, before I close, I want to give you the last word. Uh, if you were to just give one piece of advice in one sentence to everyone watching this who's inspired and says, I want to I do something. I want COVID to teach me about myself what would that be for you? I would say three things. This is what I've been sharing with people lately. One is to simply acknowledge what are you experiencing, right? Like, what are you experiencing right now? And don't be afraid of it, right? If it's fear, okay, that's okay, right? And if it's anger, if it's frustration, if it's mortal terror because you don't know you know, you don't know what, what your situation is going to be like a month from now, right? Don't be afraid of that. Uh, the second thing is, is not to push that away, right? Not to push that away. And, and the third thing is when there are, I, I think one thing that I definitely learned, especially when the emotions were incredibly overwhelming, was to force myself to look at what was beautiful in the world. And, and I, 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 this is more than one sentence you asked for, but it, it became a kind of discipline. And I would have to drive myself to the dialysis clinic, sometimes like half conscious, right? Thank God I didn't kill myself or other people, but I had to drive like 40 minutes to the dialysis clinic. And in that drive, I would force myself to look at what is beautiful around me right now. And it became a kind of discipline. And whether it was, the, and it didn't have to be some, uh, you know, marvelous sunset or something. Maybe it was just the way the light hit a certain building or the way of the shape of a tree or something. But I, I had a rigorously attuned myself to the presence of beauty in the world and that created a kind of unseen nourishment that um that really sustained me and and i think that's that's one thing that we can all do right because there no matter how bleak things look you can always find something beautiful and i think that actually is one of the great 
lessons Japan has to offer. You know, like how many times has it been ravaged through war or uh, disaster, you know? And, and that maybe, you know, because of that, that's why there is this intense commitment to creating beautiful things. It, I, I didn't think about that until now, but, but maybe that's why. And because that's what sustains us through all this craziness. And, and, that, and that's, I think, how you can be a kind of island of, uh, an island of coherence in this sea of chaos. Um, that's my answer, at least. So, uh, Jeremy Hunter, thank you so much. Your insights always uh, inspire. The good news is this doesn't have to be the end uh, for <laughs> all of you out there. We are going to have a webinar with uh, Jeremy. Uh, the title's called The Storm Makes You Stronger. Great. The storm makes you stronger to being able to be resilient like Japan and to being the island of coherence in a world of chaos. Thank you, Jeremy Hunter, for joining us today. Thank you.